So, Johnny. Yes. You know what we talk about a lot, an awful lot on this show? What, UFC? Yeah, mixed martial arts. Yes. You know, I know what we don't talk about enough on this show? What's that? Boxing. Boxing? And I think our next guest can help us with that. On the line with us right now, gold medalists in the 81 kilogram category at the Canada Games that just ended this past week, although he was competing in the first week of the competition. We have Isaiah Haya on the line here from Chris Pam Sis. How you doing, Isaiah? Good, good. How's it going? Uh, pretty good, pretty good. Uh, is the weather as bad back home as it is here? <laughs> uh, we, uh, we just had a bad storm about uh, yesterday, actually, but uh, it's uh, cleared up pretty nice, so it's actually not bad. Yeah, we know that, like, east of here where you are, because we're in Fredericton, it was supposed to be worse than here, and then we got the whole thing anyway, so it didn't matter. Oh, jeez. <laughs> That's brutal. All right, so... Uh, I think the best place to start is we're, we want to kind of do a profile, obviously, you know, Canada Games yeah. athletes in particular, you know, younger athletes don't tend to get the attention that more mainstream athletes do. So I think we're just going to start off with, so how did you get into boxing? Okay, um, so I went back about, let's say, two years ago. Um, I, a lot of my friends actually uh, were into boxing, and um, I, uh, I watched a lot of, like, uh, videos and movies and um, just like the whole uh, aspect and like the whole lifestyle actually, I really like caught my attention. So like I, uh, there was a club back in, uh, on, uh, back in August, 2017. Um, my mom actually knew the owner and uh, we just decided that it'd be, it'd be a good thing to spend my time on and I just got right into it and I fell in love. So, so you've been training for only about two years then? Uh, yeah, about a year and a half, two years. Uh, so this, I guess it's kind of a bit of a hardball question to start it off with, but like, is that sort of a typical trajectory for like an elite level boxer? <laughs> um, honestly, well, the thing is, the thing is, is actually a lot of my, uh, competition, um, usually have a bit more experience under the belt than me or have been a, a bit longer. So I don't know. I might, I just kind of caught on to things luckily for me. So Yeah. All right, so we'll move into talking about the Canada Games just for now and sort of the lead-up process. Johnny actually thought about a question he wanted to ask, so I'm going to throw it over to him for a second. Johnny, go ahead. Yeah, so um, going into the uh, Canada Games, like I know you have a gym that you train at regularly and everything, but uh, did, you, um, was, did you go through like uh, so or so like week-long camp? Or did you do any like special training or anything like that leading up to uh, the Canada Games? Um, actually, uh, yeah, um, we had, um, like, we had, like, provincial training camps, um, usually every, like, couple weeks, we'd, uh, all come to get together at any, like, club, and, uh, we'd train for about four to six hours, just working on technical work, um, lots of sparring, you know, just kind of filling in the gaps and making us, you know, strong overall as a team. Awesome. Um, and I know, like, getting into, like, when the fights are actually happening, I believe, um, how many fights is it in total for Canada Games? Uh, for me, I had to fight three times. So fighting three times in the span of, like, uh, a week? Uh, yeah, like four days. In four, in four days. So yeah. I know that, like, getting in, in, into just the process of going into one fight, um, that like the tape, the tapering off and making sure like you're not doing too much or too little and like making sure you're conserving yourself and you're not too tired or not too worn down heading into the fight. Uh, what was your camp's kind of approach going into that week, knowing you had that workload ahead of you? Um, well, uh, basically it was, uh, a lot of, a lot of the energy, like we had to work a lot on a lot of cardio and get used to a lot of uh, a lot of work at a time, so then I, I could adapt well to uh, fighting. You know, like once every day. So luckily for me, um, those camps really helped out with that, and they worked out. So let's talk about kind of getting to the Canada Games. I know because I think a lot of times people talk about the athletic side, but not the experience side. So mm -hmm. you you leave home, you're heading towards Red Deer. What's the opening week of the Canada Games like as an event? Like what what was touching down in Red Deer and just starting the whole process like? Honestly, uh, it was 
just like realizations started to kick in that you know like because before all there was all this hype and like all this talk about it and like how big of an event it is and how awesome it's going to be and then actually being there is like wow this is this is actually like just like everyone said and it's uh it's crazy like it was awesome so you it gets to sunday it's the 17th you have to go in for your first fight against quinn Neal, who from Saskatchewan, you managed to get a stoppage in that one in the third round. Did you know anything about your opponent going into that fight? Like, had you been scouted on Quinn at all, or was that, or were you sort of blind, kind of before you landed in Alberta? Um, honestly, uh, like every every fight I had, actually, uh, every fighter was uh, a new fighter to me. So like I I didn't I usually do my research and usually get videos, but I actually had like not much on uh, him. So you know, you just kind of gotta go with your instinct and just stick to your game plan and uh, try to make those adaptions like adjustments through the fight, pretty much. So I I don't think the average person at home really understands kind of the thought process of a boxer. So let's start with the preliminary fight, and we'll probably ask you about the fights going forward too. But just for that first fight, you get in the ring. It's your first fight at the Canada Games. What's going through your mind when you're in the ring? Is there, like, was there extra nerves? Were you very, very focused? And, like, what was, like, the kind of the second-by-second thought process? Um, going, actually, right right before the fight, um, Usually, you know, usually you have, like, you have your earbuds in and you'll be all focused, you know, you get pumped up. Um, I think the best mindset to have and to help you process is uh, just, like, that winning mindset. Like, you know, you're going to go in there, do your thing, you know, and uh, you're going to fight your heart out and uh, basically just come out on top with the win. That's just the mindset to have. And then just before your preliminary bout, you saw Braden Hellickson of BC fight, and obviously his fight was a first-round stoppage. You know that he's your next opponent. Was there a lot of sort of... Because he... And it sort of turned out in the tournament that he was a bit of a heavy hitter. His other fights all ended by stoppage. Were, yeah. Was there... like a mo- uh, Did you guys come up with a game plan after seeing his first fight, knowing that you were going to fight him second? Or was that... Or was it, again, just mostly instinct? Um, well, after seeing him fight, um, we realized that he, uh, he's more of a, a brawler style boxer. So, and, uh, so like, it's good, it, you know, if he's a brawler type of boxer, then obviously you're going to be expecting to go in and brawl. And, uh, basically, you know, I was just, I was ready. I was ready for that power because I, I knew he had it because, uh, I, I faced it, I've, I faced it before, like my first, my first fight, the preliminaries. Quinn, he had lots of power too. So um, honestly, I was kind of expecting the same kind of fight from him as the first one. So uh, you face Braden. It's a it's a really really good fight for you. You know, you manage to stay away from the big hit. You get the unanimous decision. You end up knowing that you're going to face Tiago Baltero from Ontario in the finals. And uh, it's notable even if you go and watch the streams that you know he had a pretty big supporter section there in Red Deer. So did it sort of feel like he kind of had, like, home ring advantage? Um, definitely going into the fight, um, I kind of had, like, that uh, under underdog view because he, uh, you know, he was he's also a very skillful fighter. He, he was two-time provincial champ, one-time national champ. So, you know, he already had that experience. You know, he had those gold medal matches. So um, I definitely was... We're the underdog, but, uh, you know, I just, I brought it to him and gave him everything I had. Yeah, so Isaiah, so for those who don't know as much about the logistics of boxing, and in sports you see a lot of uh, impact hits to the head or in d- different parts of the body. So now, how do you initiate a quick turnaround when, when you have to do three fights in such a short period of time? Um, honestly, the um, most important thing is rest you know you need a lot of rest because because not you know your the average body isn't meant to take beating after beating each day so it's good to rest um drink a lot of water and uh if you say you have any injuries um luckily we had physio we had massages massages so um we had you know we had everything we needed to uh 
you know, get ready for the next match. So, obviously, the Baltero fight wasn't perfect. The third round didn't exactly go the way I imagine you would have wanted it to. Walk us through the last few minutes of that fight. Well, um, basically, um, at that point, uh, you know, it was it's a gold medal match, so there's a lot of hype to it. So, you know, the adrenaline's going, and uh, he, where you know, it's like a, it was a dog fight, basically. Um, it was it basically came down to who won, who had the heart, who wanted. It, he wanted it more, and uh, so you know, I just as the as the bell it was count, the countdown was going. You know, I was just f- fighting it all with all I had in me, just emptying the tank. All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about kind of your profile here. So before you went to the Canada Games and they did your sort of biography, you said your goal was to win the gold medal. So. How long did it take you after that initial, like, win to realize that, you know, you'd kind of set the goal and then mission accomplished? Uh, honestly, um, when, I, when I heard them, when I raised my hand, um, it was, it felt, you know, like, it didn't even feel real at the time, you know. I was just shocked. I was like, uh, you know, I, I came in here, I did what I said I'd do. Um, and then after that, kind of after that, it kind of kicked in and then, it was just, it was crazy. It was, it was very, uh, very exciting. It was, I was hyped. It was pretty surreal. Now, obviously, you didn't know it was going to be the case at the time, but there is, is there anything a little extra special about it now, knowing that you're like the only Team New Brunswick gold medalist from this Canada Games? Um, there is, there is. Um, you know, I'm just, I'm glad that I'm, I feel honored to be able to uh, represent my province. Um, you know, make them proud. Make. Um, all my supporters proud, my family proud, um, my friends proud. So honestly, it just is uh, it's a big accomplishment. And uh, just, uh, yeah, it's bas- basically, that's how I put it. And uh, we did this sort of with Cameron too, with Cameron McMaster. And I think it's a good way for us to close the interview with you. So what's next for you? Like, what's your next big step? What are you aiming for now? Um, so... My next, uh, my next big thing now is um, in April I have uh, nationals in Victoria, BC. Um, I'm basically, you know, I'm going there, going to try to get the gold medal once again, um, and then hopefully make the uh, national elite, uh, youth team. And uh, we'll just see where that goes, and then can just keep going. Well, from all of us to you, Isaiah, thank you for coming on the show. Congratulations on the gold medal performance. Uh, it was really, really great watching you. Uh, kind of the last closing question, and then we'll we'll kind of pitch your 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 camp and your uh, your gym and everything. But uh, uh, yeah. last thing was, what was it like? Like, when did you know that the final fight was going to be on prime time, and how did it feel knowing that you were being broadcast nationwide? Uh, I was. That's another thing too. Is uh, is the fact that it was it was on TV and it was live, so. You know, I figured like if I if I, you know, give it all all I have, you know, it's a lot of good exposure. It opens up new doors, um, helps make new connections, and uh, you know, if if it weren't for that, I maybe wouldn't even be talking to you right now. But uh, yeah. All right, that was Isaiah Haya, gold medal winning boxer from Chris Pamsis. His gym is East Coast Boxing in Rothsay. You can find them online at eastcoastboxing.ca. If perhaps your Family members, young people, whatnot, would be more interested in getting into some combat sports. That option's available for you. Isaiah, thanks for coming on. Hey, thank you very much. And that was boxer Isaiah Haya. Thank you, Isaiah, for coming on the show. But he's not our only Canada Games interview. We, in fact, have another interview here with uh, silver medal winning gymnast at the Canada Games, uh, Walter Cameron McMaster. Joining us on the line now for the second segment of our show, we have uh, Canada Games silver medalist in the vault. He's a former second place Canadian national championship participant in 2017, third place in 2018 from Quiz Pamsis. This is Cameron McMaster. How are you doing, Cameron? Good. How are you? Doing great. Uh, Is it just as cold in Quiz Pamsis as it is in Fredericton right now? Um, I believe so, but I'm not really sure. We didn't really pass through Fredericton on our way home. Yeah, you would would have probably flown back into Moncton, right? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, I guess really, really quick, I'll give you kind of a chance to do, to tell people like who who you are in, in in that sense. So, we sort of kind of introed you, but uh, 
I guess the best place to start is, you know, how did you get into gymnastics? Well, we'll start, we'll start at the beginning and we'll kind of go forward. So how did you get into gymnastics? Um, how it started was like, I was always, like as a little kid, I was always in my mom's or my mom and dad's backyard um, on the trampoline doing like these little flips and stuff that I was like, like nothing crazy, but like I was just trying to do like these weird flips and stuff because I thought they were cool. And then my parents thought it'd be a cool idea to put me into gymnastics. And then when I went into the rec program, I actually did like so well that I was only there for like a couple months and they put me like immediately into a competitive program and then it just kind of grew from there really. So you've been competing for a considerable amount of time then. Yep, about 10 years I believe now. So we'll kind of fast forward a little bit. Obviously there's maybe some interesting stories in the middle time, but you know, we'll kind of fast forward to the last couple of years. So 2017, you're competing at the Canadian National Championship. Yep. Uh, so what what was that experience like? Because that wouldn't be your first major competition, but it was like the first, I, I guess major is the correct way to describe it, but I'm trying to separate between competition. I guess it'd be your first major competition. Going to the 2017 National yeah. Championships? Um, it wasn't like my first major one because before that I competed at the, the 2015 Winter Games, which was actually my first national competition. But... The 2017 game, or national championships was something special because I think it was like the first all-around medal I've ever gotten in a national ca- category, which is like for me quite a big thing. So 2017 was a special year for me, yeah. So I know that when you did your interview setting up for the games, they asked you sort of what your goals were and you were hoping to you know, have the team medal and then bring home the individual medal. So you, so you ended up kind of one for two because you ended up getting your silver and red deer. Yep. Um, kind of walk us through the lead up to competing there because the team event was before the individual disciplines. Yes. So coming out of the team event, did you were you a little disappointed in what had happened up to that point or were you confident that you, you could still take an individual medal home after that? Um, after the team event, I was definitely a little bit disappointed because me and my teammates, we thought we were going to do a lot better than we did so seeing the results that we had I was kind of I was a little bit bummed out but from like past national championships I learned that like you know even after that you got to keep your head up and just keep going after it so you know I like I had I had no expectations for what was going to happen afterwards but I I don't know like I don't know how to describe it like uh well, so let's let's kind of keep talking. So you mentioned that you had been in Prince George for the 2015 Canada Winter Games. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was your first major competition, uh, and on like a national category. On like a, in like national category. Yeah. What what was different going to Red Deer this time compared to four years ago? Um, I think this time that we actually had like similar skills. You know, like, going in in 2015 games, like, just watching all these other guys do all these amazing skills was just, like, surreal to me. Like, it was unbelievable. And then this year when we went in, it was just kind of like, hey, these guys are kind of doing the same thing as me. Maybe we actually have a shot at it. So it's kind of like, you know, an eye-opener, I guess, to say when we go this year. Like, it was was cool. Yeah, so... Cameron, I actually got a chance to watch your pommel horse from the 2015 Canada Games, and I got to say, like, that's absolutely phenomenal, the the way you sort of just spin around on that platform. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, like, what, what kind of training would you even have to do? Like, what muscles would you have to enhance to be able to do something like that? Um, for the pommel horse, it's sort of, like, it's all balance. Like, people think, like, like when I was at the 2019 games, I had some guy come up to me. He's like, "Oh, that one's all core," and I was like, "No, it's just it's all balance." Because like the whole time, like when you're swinging around the horse, you're constantly off balance, just swinging your body around. I mean, it will require a little bit of shoulders after about like five minutes of spinning around the horse, but like the whole thing is just being able to balance and check yourself the whole time. So we, of course, kind of been following the Canada Games. We have seen some of your events, some of the team stuff as well. Uh, For someone who's not in the know for gymnastics, walk us through what competing in the vault is like. What is it like from the perspective of an athlete? Like the vault finals? Uh, Yeah, sure. We'll we'll, we'll we'll do the vault finals here. 
Um, for Vault specifically, I think that one's like really, really nerve wracking because like all the other events, you have like this good minute long routine where like you can make a mistake and recover. But for Vault, it's so like when it's so fast and so sudden, if you make like one little mistake, it could ruin the whole Vault. So standing there at the end of the Vault strip, like ready to run down, you're just kind of like really hoping to hit the whole thing and make it as perfect as possible. So. Yeah, for me, it's 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 nerve wracking, but I also enjoy that part. Um, what is going through your mind mentally, like the couple seconds before you perform your vault? Is it uh, is it like what are you like telling yourself in order to make sure you have the best performance? Um, before I do my vault, like before I even salute or anything, I'm always going through like the major like corrections that I usually get at the gym. So like. I don't know if you guys know, but like when I go off the vault, like I need to sit up so I can rotate more and then ro- twist after so I don't land on my face and then be ready for the landing. And then when I salute to the judge, all I think is relax and then just power. Like I just got to be powerful because that's basically all it is. So is performing an actual vault a like a long series of really, really quick kind of checks and balances, or are you sort of committing to something before you push off the platform? Um, it's kind of like like at the beginning, before I even go, like I'm running through the whole skill, like super slow in my head, like how I should feel. And then when you actually go, like you just like speed the whole thing up to like a second. So like when I leave the vault, I'll be like, I need to straighten my body off the vault, pike up, then twist down, then be ready for the landing. And like those four steps will happen in like a second before I even like do the skill. Now, obviously when you were entering your vault final, you had a, like some pretty stiff competition. Felix Dulce and Nathan Navarez had put up pretty good scores that you had to compete against. Yeah. Was there any worry when you were going in about the other people you're competing with or were you confident that you could compete at least right from the start? Um, going into the finals, I knew that Felix was going to get me because his vault was significantly higher. All he had to do was land it. All the other guys, I thought if I could just land my vault, I would have a chance of landing amongst them. So I was fairly confident that I could like, I could get up there with the vault that I was doing, but I, I didn't think I would actually get as far as I did, which was, uh, which was like the amazing part for me. So... You end up with the silver medal here. What, what's the next step for you? Canada Games are over. You're back home. Obviously, we're having you on to kind of celebrate what I think is a pretty monumental achievement. I guess I have two questions to ask here. Which do you think is more significant? Is it the Canada Games medal or is it that first Canadian National Championship medal? Um, that's kind of a hard question because, like, for the national, like, my first national medal that I got, like, the all-around one, was more of like a inspiring moment because it's kind of like hey you can actually do it like you can go to national competitions and win a medal and then the Canada Games one was kind of like I don't know like it was unbelievable because Canada Games is like some of the best gymnasts in the country so to go out there and actually win a medal was kind of crazy even though it was after before like when I won my other one it's just like such a special event it's it was just amazing I don't know so Cameron so on that topic of like a next step do you see yourself sort of moving up to another level maybe a North American championship or a, maybe even an appearance at the Olympics um, the Olympics I don't know that's probably like a longer road for me but my next goal would probably be to go senior level, so like the highest you can go and compete against like literally everybody in the nation and see like where I place then and then I'll just work from there and then whatever comes like whatever opportunities come at me I'll probably take them. All right, Cameron, that's about all the time that we have. We want to thank you for joining us, of course, and uh, you know, giving us an opportunity to share a little bit in what's been a really great experience for you and, of course, giving us something kind of entertaining to share from a very different perspective because I think maybe the average sports fan isn't as in tune with gymnastics as most other sports. So yeah. uh, thank you very much for coming on. We definitely appreciate it, and it's been a pleasure watching you. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. 
We would love to thank Cameron and Isaiah for being on the show. This is, of course, Overtime Radio on CHSR 979 FM in Fredericton, New Brunswick, Canada. They were great guests. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Of course, it's me in the booth, Kaylee Etheridge here with Johnny James and Sean Crocker. Uh, we got about half an hour left to kind of break down some stuff. We're going to skip the AUS hockey finals. We're going to talk about those on Monday because we're going to wait for the series to end so we can give a better full picture of what's going on. Um, so that's kind of the plan for those. But we will give you, of course, a full breakdown of those series, including mine and Sean's experience calling Game 1 for Bell for Monday's episode, we promise. So instead, we're going to jump into the AUS, but we're going to instead talk about basketball. Yes, so uh, they had the uh, basketball uh, men's and women's uh, uh, championships for the AUS uh, at the uh, Scotiabank Center, formerly the Metro Center in Halifax. Yeah. And, uh, Which is where I think the AUS has hosted their championship for the last few years. Yeah, I believe so. It's a great, it's a great uh, place to do so. Um, uh, on the men's side of Dalhousie Tigers, uh, defeated the St. Mary's Huskies. Uh, the UMB defending champion uh, UMB Reds did not. They won't even go to nationals. So they lost to Dal. Yeah, because they lost to Dal in the semis and everything. Um, and that's, so it's that's disappointing just because UMB ruined St. Mary's perfect season, and then yeah, the Huskies beat them too, but. Yeah, and the Huskies didn't even win the championship after that. So, um, Dow ends up, uh, yeah, Dow ends yeah. up uh, going forward. And then on the women's side, which was a lot more like uh, more in- a little bit more of an interesting storyline with uh, Haley McDonald putting up eighty points in the final two games. For she put up fifty one in the semifinals. Yeah, I don't even know how deep into the archives I'd have to go to find the last fifty burger in this league. Yeah. On no, you have to on, be on either the men's or the women's side. Yeah, yeah. Did Javon Masters do it at all when he was nope. here last year? No. I know he topped forty a couple times. Mm-hmm. Pretty sure. Yep. Oh, he sure did. No, it's uh, was a crazy performance. Uh, I was looking at some of the highlights actually from it, and like just the three balls, like every shot was was going in for her in that game. Fifty putting up fifty one. Obviously, was player of the game, and that one was the best. Was leading the charge as she has all. All season for the uh, Acadia Axe women, and uh, they take the title pretty uh, in pretty convincing fashion uh, over the over this weekend. So they'll go to nationals along with uh, Dalhousie, I guess. Yeah, they will. Those two teams will go. Um, we know most of the teams that are going to be in nationals for men's and women's hockey. We're just waiting mostly on AUS to figure that out. Yep. Um, I thought the women's tournament was really entertaining. Yep, for sure. The men's tournament, I think, was more. Not that the men's tournament it wasn't entertaining, but it was disappointing to see UNB go out so early. And St. Thomas yeah. went out in the ACAA tournament really early, too. And yeah. then ACAA women made it all the way to the finals and then got pounded by Mount St. Vincent, who were undefeated. So, like, the two teams that weren't doing as well lost, but the tournaments were more entertaining. Yeah. And then the two teams that were expected to do well didn't get there. And for ACAA, because of how the CCAA works... Even though St. Thomas is the runner-up, they don't get a berth to Nationals. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's unfortunate. No, and it's a shame because, well, for St. Thomas, it was easily a benchmark season. And then you 17 just... 17-4? and four? Yep. And then so you run into... And 5 once you count the playoff games? Yeah, and then you play a team that was ranked, I think, 4th or 5th in the country. Yeah, who are, so, who are 22-0 and 0 when you play them in the finals. Yeah, no, it's bad break. That's and all it is. On the men's like on the men's side, Holland won the tournament, which they were expected to do, but they were the top ranked team in the country. Like Holland College was putting like 80, 90, 100 points on people. There was one game this year they beat Stu like 121 to 91 or something crazy like that. Oh yeah. I'm surprised that Stu hung 91 on them. Yeah. If I'm being honest. Like that Holland team's probably winning a national championship. Men's basketball. There's no doubt in my mind. They always win. Um, so that's pretty much everything for AUS. Oh, uh, we should for. note that McMaster's performances did lead Acadia to a championship. That's notable. We Look, should we should we didn't mention that Acadia won the title. We just mentioned that she play, put up eighty points over the semifinal. You mean Mc, McDonald? Not McDonald. McMaster. Sorry, not yep. McMaster. Um, just yeah. had the interview on. Confusing my names here. Yes, McDonald. The eighty yep. points led Acadia to a championship. Yep. Not that I imagine anyone at home was surprised by that. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, important to mention mm-hmm, for sure. Um, so do we want to move into the NHL? Because we've got lots of things to talk about on that front. Um, some more Man, no some more uh, honorary things. Uh, uh, Jerome McGinley's number uh, was retired this past week. Uh, yeah, it was a really, really nice ceremony. It was like an hour and a half. Was it? An yeah, hour and well, a half? Yeah, the whole, the whole ceremony was like an hour and a half. They only aired, I think, the last 15 or 20 minutes. Yeah. Before the game. Well, and they did it before the warm-ups, too. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So 
Yeah, and, um, and the building was still packed. Yeah, for sure. What's the best player in franchise history? And a bunch of teams yeah. like sent like their like thank yous and stuff. Like there was one from Trevor Linden. Yeah. Because uh, for people who don't remember this, obviously I do because I'm a Canucks fan. The night that Linden retired, his last game was against the Flames. Oh, and really? And Ginla went to, stood in front of the bench and stopped the Flames from coming off the ice and forced them to all go back and shake Linden's hand. Oh, really? Yeah. That's, see, that's just the type of character Jerome McGinley was. Man was a class act. Absolutely. And Still the is. best player in Flames history, and unfortunately he has to go into the echelon of best players to never win a cup. Yeah. He's still a first ballot Hall of Famer, 600 goals. He has the Oh, yeah, no. No. 100%. He's a first ballot Hall of Famer for sure. And even if he never won a Stanley Cup, he has one moment intrinsically tied to his name that's going to be in the minds of Canadians forever. Um. I'm guessing that's his fight against Vincent LeCalvier? No, 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 no. no. Oh, for uh, the, the... the Iggy. Iggy. Oh, okay, Iggy, yeah. Literally, for... it, literally, Crosby hops off the bench, beelines it for the net, and you just hear him scream. You can hear it on the broadcast. Iggy! Iggy. Yeah. Yep. And you have to remember, like at that moment, again, was fighting two other power forwards in the corner and still comes away with the puck. He doesn't even know whether the pass is going to hit on the tape. He just flings it in the general direction of which he hears Crosby. And Crosby. Which, of course, ends up being a tape-to-tape pass that Crosby puts, like, what, five hole on Miller, was it? Yeah. And if you have OCD, you'll love the stats because they're spot on 625 goals, 675 assists for 1,300 exactly on the dot. Yeah, that's the first bad Hall of Famer, all right? Yeah, absolutely. Yep, in 15, 54 games, so. Yeah, well, longest serving captain in Flames history, yeah. too, has to, Easily. Has, has to have been. Yeah. yeah. And, and he'll go into the Hall as a Flame for sure. Yeah, absolutely. I think that his... If I were the Hockey Hall of Fame, I know they don't do this often, but if I were them, his plaque would also have a Team Canada jersey on it. Yeah. And I don't think there's any other way. Yeah, that's true. That's true, because he's... Was he on the... Uh, he, was he was on the uh, O2 Salt Lake team? Yep, he was yeah, on both. Sure was. I'm pretty sure he was on both. Yeah, he was on both. Yeah, true. Yeah, he's been on everyone since then. Yeah, so... Um, yeah, Except great, the 24th. great career, both on the NHL and uh, internationally. And, and yeah, off the ice. Off the ice, too, yeah. Uh, it was nice to see his uh, the night of his ceremony. Uh, the his uh, two sons got to take morning skate or warm up yeah, skate, morning with, skate with the flames with the yeah. flames. So that was pretty cool. So um, he will be around that organization for a long time. Yeah, in, unless he decides he wants to step away from the game of hockey, he will always have a job with the flames. Yeah, for sure. Because that team would have to be completely bananas to not make up a job for him. Absolutely. You are. Manager of fan ambassadorness, global Here, ambassador. Here, yeah, here's your sixty thousand dollar paycheck. Absolutely, if you even want it. Yeah, that's basically like your pension if you even need it at this point. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, but on a sadder note, uh, we say goodbye to a another player that was uh, was both uh, great on and off the ice. Uh, from uh, back well, long before we started watching the game, but uh, definitely made it better for the players. And the fact that it is better for the players is probably the reason why uh, the NHL is able to thrive and be as exciting as it is today. Uh, Ted Lindsay passed away. Um, yeah. Was it two days two days ago at the time that we we are recording this? So uh, uh, yes. Yep. So uh, multiple time uh, Art Ross winner for the Detroit Red Wings. Uh, was their captain? I uh, was a part of the um, was the the production line with uh, Gordy Howe, and I forget uh, who else was on that line. Uh, Probably like a, a dynasty worth of line um, for the Detroit Red, Red Wings. Uh, four Stanley Cups, I believe, and in between, uh, and he also had his uh, career. Uh, halted because he retired after he went to Jack Adams, who was the general manager of Detroit at the time, saying like, hey, how are you guys making millions of dollars and all of these players are making $10,000 a year? And he basically like retired to commit himself off the ice, uh, formed the NHLPA, yeah. uh, which has been advocating for players' rights ever since and is the reason why Connor McDavid is able to make it, He's in the hall, up. right? 12.5. Um, Lindsay, yeah, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, is he as a player or a builder? I wonder. I think it's as a player. Well, he he also has an award named after him. I'm not sure what it's for. I think it's outstanding play. Yeah, yeah, it's the outstanding player. It's the one that like that's voted on by by the the NHLPA one, right? Yeah, the one that David has won the last like three or four years. Eight hundred fifty-one points in one thousand sixty-eight games. So yeah, I don't know that. 
it's close. Yeah. It's close to a point per game. Also, I mean, it's also the era, right? Yes. And one thing that uh, he uh, no he he was in the Hall of Fame because this was an interesting story that came out. Uh, Jeff Merrick tweeted this when the news broke uh, that uh, Ted Lindsay boycotted his own Hockey Hall of Fame induction ceremony because uh, due to the uh, sexist tendencies at the time, uh, they were, were not permitting his wife and his daughters to attend the ster- to attend the ceremony. So he's like, uh, no, screw you, I am not doing this, and uh, you should uh, reconsider your rule, and now, well, obviously. He is inducted. He was inducted in 66. Yeah. So after yeah. they yeah. dealt he, with that. Yeah, no, he well, he still went in. He just wasn't, he didn't go up and, like, take a speech or anything like that. He boycotted oh, the ceremony that's because fair. they wouldn't let any of the women in his family come. So, um, yeah, so a great career on and off. And, I, and like, that's I didn't know all all of that about Ted Lindsay until this all came out. So this is... Reminder that Ted was his second middle name. What's that? What? It, Ted Lindsay. Yeah. Ted Theodore was his second middle name. Oh, really? Yeah, he's Robert Blake Theodore Lindsay. Yeah. So you can throw terrible... Terrible Lindsay. Ted. Terrible Ted Lindsay. Um, yeah, it's 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 the original kind of like uh, prototypical like gooner. Like not, not really because he scored like two. Like a power but, forward. Yeah, uh, but like played a really hard, really intense game on the ice, but was uh, had a very soft side off the ice and uh, did a lot of great things for the game. So I think we can leave that at that. Yeah. yeah. Rest in peace. 93 years old. Yeah. So uh, from that, uh, we should go, well, speaking of a player that uh, has, that corrected some dumb things by NHL management, we could talk about some more dumb things from NHL management. Uh, the GM meetings are happening uh, right now, and they've come up with a rule that's really good, and have come out uh, opposing something that's kind of stupid. So um, they came out and uh, li- just good then bad, good then bad, yeah, good good then good bad. Then bad. Um, they have the uh, r- new rule that I guess is going to be implemented next season, or they're they're snowballing it around. I'm not sure if they've confirmed it yet, but uh, if you take your helmet off. And don't immediately leave the ice to play. If you lose your helmet, if you not, lose your helmet, if you you don't have to take it off yeah. yourself. Yeah, but if you if you lose it and you don't immediately leave the ice, you can be assessed a two minute minor, which is good. Yeah. That's the rule in minor hockey. Yep, and it should be the good rule in the NHL. And before we get to the bad stuff, they also want to implement a rule where if you take a penalty, then the team that has the ensuing power play gets to choose what side of the ice the faceoffs on. What what do you, what do you mean? Face-offs in the defensive end, but if I'm not mistaken, it's whichever face-off dot is closest to the position of the penalty yeah. on the opposite side. It's, it's, yeah, it's whatever side of the ice it happened on. You can vertically. choose to change that now. Oh, okay. Or you will be able to. Yeah, so so it affects handedness and what players a coach wants out there. Well, yeah, it depends. Once you set up the, the defenseman you want taking your point S- shot. Set up, Yeah, or set up the winger that you want to set up the one time or two. So uh, obviously if you're like Washington, you always play it to Ovi's side. Yeah. Have Ovi, like have the middle of the Have side. Backstrom take it to Ovi. Yeah. I don't know how I feel about that rule. Yeah. I think it's great. I don't know. That, I, I, that's a great extra strategy to the game. Yeah. I actually suggested a pretty extreme rule to Sean in between periods on the broadcast. Me and Sean were talking about. So statistically, if a power play runs over the end of a period, it's less likely to result in a goal. Okay. Like dramatically, I think the end of a period cuts the effectiveness of a power play by like twenty percent or something. Probably like that. more. Mm-hmm. I think twenty percent from like an yeah, like yeah, I think it's way more than that actually. Okay. Um, Lowers your convert, lowers your total conversion rate by twenty percent or something like that. So I was suggesting to Sean that they should make that if a power play stretches over the period, the opening face off of the next period is taken in the defensive end. Hmm. Maybe. It's neat. I yeah. think that'd be interesting. It's a change. concept. Yeah, absolutely. And the helmet rule is great, by the way. Absolutely. Yeah. Just oh, more, yeah, yeah. more for safety. Like we already have enough issues protecting the cranium. Brain of, jars. As yeah. It is. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so getting into something that's being opposed, that's was voted 60% against when they did their NHL player polls recently. Um, 60% of the current players playing in the NHL are against the current playoff format. But Bill Daly has uh, come out and said that they will not be uh, changing the playoff format anytime soon because, like, basically, like, we... Kaylee pretty much predicted it when we were talking before the show and pretty much recited the same press release that he uh, uh, Because it's doing said. what the owners in the NHL wants, which is that it's preserving divisional rivalries and making interdivision playoff matches a rare attraction. Yeah, and uh, in, in, in essence, they mean that means more ratings and more money. 
So, which is smart for the NHL and really, really crappy for us. Yeah, because uh, it's come out now that uh, the top five, well, your top five uh, uh, teams, like two of them, will be out by the end of the second round Three or something. Will be out Three of them. Three of them. Round. Yeah, and that's that's ridiculous. Because that's like Tampa, Boston, uh, Toronto, Islanders, Toronto, Toronto, and Calgary. Calgary. Okay. Yeah, something like that. So two or three of them will be out by the second round. Yep. So. Uh, I don't know. It's it's a really crappy thing. It's nothing we can really do about it. So I'm not sure what we can like do to harp on that. But like, I don't know. That's it seems like it, it devalues the regular season. That's for sure. Well, I think logistically speaking, they initially went to the format when they realigned the conferences to accommodate Winnipeg going west and two teams coming east. Um, so now, essentially, if you go in the one to eight format, I don't know how many people this might tick off, but it's it's easier, quote unquote, to get in in the west. Because there's less teams. Which was part of the reason why they made the change. It's technically still easier to get in in the West. But in yes. two years, we're going to add Seattle, and that's not a problem anymore. Well, and that's the time to change. Or, you or the time you look for it. change it now, so it's already changed before Seattle gets in. Yeah. Either way, it's, it's, a, it's a bad system. Mm-hmm. Bad uh, system. Uh, I mean, of course, you guys will say that. You guys have to play the well, Bruins every year. Well, it's not... Do you think the Bruins are... Well... Maybe they're stoked to play us or anything like that, but still. Uh, for like the top five teams are Tampa, Calgary, Boston, Toronto, and San Jose, which means that if everybody wins as they're expected to, Toronto gets knocked out in the first round, then Tampa and Boston play, and Calgary and San Jose play. So three of the top five teams will be If that's the way it goes down. <laughs> I'm saying, I just said if the top teams won, it wasn't hard. Oh, for oh top team won. Okay, I, I get what you're saying. But yeah, like if you, if you work that hard and you get that high up in the standings, you should earn like at least... Uh, a decent like opening round matchup against a lower seeded team. And the, the thing is, if you like three of the top five is really bad, but if you actually stretch it out a little bit further, it's also going to be four of the top eight. Yeah, that's great. Because inside that's the crazy. top eight is also Washington and the Islanders. Yeah. So of the top eight teams, four of them will be gone by the final four. Yeah. I- so unless your final four teams are literally the four best teams that are left. The point is, like, you can call well, you call me and Sean, like, Salty Maple Leafs fans because, like, oh, we're going to give up Boston. Understand, like, we would it'd be a great advantage to not play Boston in the first round, although we would probably still run into them in the second round anyways. But um, it makes it less likely that the best team in the NHL is going to win because when you, when you like, just clog up, like, those intense matchups in the first round, like, You'll get knocked out, and it doesn't. Your placement overall, as as you finish the season, doesn't really reflect how your team was that year. If the NHL instead r- abolished the divisions and conferences and just went one to sixteen, the Flyers would make the playoffs. Dallas and Minnesota would not. Yeah, yeah, but that, that's that's that will always happen once you have like the conference and everything like that. Oh yeah, I'm not suggesting abolish the conferences. What I would actually like to see happen is this is where you get into weird stuff too, because. Once you have eight teams in each, I actually don't hate the current system if you change it, which is that I think that if you're going to call these, don't call them divisions, actually call them conferences. You have the Atlantic Conference, the Metropolitan Conference, the Central Conference, and the West and the Pacific Conference. Okay. Top four teams from each. And then you have four conference champions that play two that, in the West, two in the East. That would be interesting. That would be really it, interesting. It doesn't fix your system, but I think it's a lot more consistent with the goal. Like, if the goal of the NHL is that they want the divisions to matter the most, then the division should matter the most. Yeah. OUA ran with this same system in men's hockey forever. Mm-hmm. Yeah, do that. Yeah, absolutely. Like, I realize that, that means that sometimes you're going to have really undeserving teams squeak in as, like, like the Pacific Four seed right now would be Arizona. Something like that, yeah. Even they're not they're that like undeserving. Nine. Yeah. But you, even though, like, out of, like, the 16 teams that you have into the playoffs, there's always going to be ones that are less deserving. There's always going to be weak divisions or conferences, whatever the hell you want to call but them. But the thing that you can do, too, is if you want to really change it up, is you can establish a schedule where conference champions change. So you could do, like, okay, this year it's going to be Pacific against Central, Met against... Uh, Atlantic, and we have a traditional East-West Stanley Cup, but what if you change the rotation and then your conference championship round is like Pacific Met Central. Oh, crossover. I think you would want to do that at that at Because the, you that could rotate it, and then occasionally you have the option of having an All-West or All-East semifinal, yeah. which is the exact same as what other league that we've been following pretty intently for the last couple of years? Bring, that very recently had a Rangers-Giants 
World Series that was fantastic? The, uh, the MLB? Major League Baseball has a division in each geographical region in each conference, so it's possible to have an all-Western yeah, World that's Series. True. A, if you want to do the rivalries, like give the option to potentially have one of those rivalries in the Stanley Cup final, the games that you would want those eyeballs on the most. I mean, okay, so I know that this is sort of like dumb niche stuff, but what if when you got to the conference championship round, the champion that had the most points in the regular season got to choose their opponent to get or, into the Stanley you, Cup? What, what if you reseed? Yeah, even better. Yeah. What, you reseed, yeah. So it's one, so best against worst. Yeah, so like, if you that, that would make the president's trophy worth a hell of a lot more because you get the top. Because you, to get to the Stanley Cup Finals, you get the worst opponent left. Yeah, exactly. Which you technically do every round, or in the current system, you don't get, and you won't get for the first two rounds. Mm -hmm. Technically, you get it for the third round or whatever, which is why I think choosing your opponent's a little more interesting. Yeah, than, that's true. Because you also have the financial benefit too, like and yeah. it adds intrigue. If I'm Toronto and the Metropolitan winning team is, let's say, the Islanders right now, yeah. even if the matchup's worse for you, for money, you might take that matchup anyway. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, it depends, too, because for a team like Toronto, you might not be taking that into account because they, they're already sitting on mounds but of money. Once you have Seattle in, you have eight perfectly balanced conferences. Yeah. You can minimize the travel schedule by being like, you play every team in your division four times wait no that's too many seven so you'd play seven four fourteen it'd be a similar schedule later yeah like, like yeah. now actually i think if you do eight times eight times seven is 56 games yeah so it's not quite right because you have to play every, wait because then it takes seven teams or it takes eight teams out so you'd have 24 teams left you've played 56 games that gets you to 80 yeah and then you could have two other games that are just randomly assigned to you, maybe a home and away against another team. Yeah, absolutely. And just rotate those last two games every year. For then sure. your schedule is incredibly weighted to your conference. You still play everybody else two times. You get a random matchup that's two extra games that could be... Or, or you re reduce the season to 80. Why not? Why not? I know that the owners would be like, but that's one less home, it's one less home game for each team. That's all it is. Yeah. Absolutely. You lose one less home game, you get a perfectly square schedule for every single team, and your conferences matter most. It's what the NHL wants to do, but better than the NHL can do it. Yeah, absolutely. I am the yep. voice of reason. Yeah, uh, that's that's some good ideas, for sure. They'll never do it. Absolutely. Add us, Bill Daly. Come on. We we can do this. <laughs> um, anyway, we're down to about eight minutes left. So We're, we're down to about eight minutes. Silverberg, uh, really, really quick, is getting paid way too much. Okay. Uh, well, I, I'd rather talk about, we need to talk about Boucher getting fired. Guy Boucher. Do we? Yeah, we do. No, we don't. It was a gong we show. We we, I'm literally just going to play the carnival music clip for ten minutes, and we're going to cut back to the show, okay? <laughs> but it's just, it's, it's just, it's just bad. It's just really bad. Like, it's... But yeah, the, the Boucher firing's terrible for no reason. They had no reason to fire him, and I don't want to talk about it anymore because it's really crappy what happened to him, and I hope that he gets a good NHL job going forward. Fair enough. Jakob Silverberg. Contract looks bad, but it's apparently not as bad as it looks. We turn it over to our numbers guy. Okay, so now uh, Silverberg is playing under what he usually is for Corsi-wise and analytics and just shot quality, so he's at a 46%, uh, the, the mean being 50 and at a 95.6% PDO. So, so that's just in reference to the fact that he doesn't get a lot of opportunities from prime areas and his line mates aren't as good as his career average. So now something of note is that his expected goals for it, like based on possession quality, so it takes into account for where the shots come from and the league average shooting percentage from that area. And if he was shooting at the same percentage as the average, he, he's expected to get 28 goals. That's pretty good. He, he's so the, so the five and change doesn't look so bad. The five and change doesn't look so bad, but he's never top 23. 23 is his career high. So you're really taking a gamble on a guy who's 26. And who, hasn't ever been a 20, 25 goal scorer? Never been a 25 goal scorer. So, I mean, and you, you're probably getting him for defensive metrics because he starts 57% of his ice time in the defensive zone. So... And in fact, if, uh, for the past few years, he's gotten Selkie votes. Yeah, so he's more fair. Yeah, so okay. right. I mean, it's it's a bad contract. Don't get me wrong, but Puliyarvi. Puliyarvi is about to go undergo uh, season ending ending uh, surgery. I think I believe it's on his knee. I think something uh, like that. 
Yeah, Either way, it doesn't matter. He's been out for the last 10 games or so, and he's done. He's shut down for the yeah, season. Yeah, for sure. Which so, is a, and the Oilers have won their last three without him? Hip surgery. Something, his hip yeah. surgery? Yeah. Um, well, it's good. Uh, I'm not. Sh- hopefully he wasn't playing for too long with uh, in that condition. the Oilers but, have a history of this. Yeah, they did that to Clefbaum last year. They announced that he needed surgery, but he played the three games leading up to his surgery date. That's just bad management. Yeah, absolutely. So, again, another bad team making uh, dumb decisions. Um, to kind of wrap up uh, hockey-wise, just one last thing of note. Uh, humble Broncos uh, former player uh, Morgan Gobiel. Yes, last is, player's out of the hospital. Yeah. Yeah, over, after over, more than 330 days in hospital, I believe it yeah, was. Yeah, physio and the whole nine yards. Yeah, so it's physio and speech therapy. He and walked out, like too. Did he walk out? I thought he was in a wheelchair. Or uh, maybe rolled out. He, he was holding the... I know when they took the picture, he was holding the belief. He was sitting in a wheelchair in that was picture, though, I'm pretty sure. So I had, The only version I saw was cut off at the waist, so I didn't see it. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, did you just see the sign? So, someone wrote in the article that he walked out, which I... And I know that, like, kind of colloquially, you're not supposed to say, like, rolled, so that might have been where I got that impression. Uh, that's fair. Yeah, that's true. But anyway, it's good to see that, like, he's finally at a hospital and doesn't have to have that constant reminder of everything that happened. Yeah. Although it's... It still lingers, but it's it's still it's good to see him back to at least subnormal health. Yeah. yeah. Um, last thing, UFC. How much time? I got? Time? Uh, like seven minutes. Seven minutes. Okay, so UFC two thirty six. We believe. have our first champion from a new continent. Absolutely. Um, they're talking about uh, potentially UFC Africa after Usman is now a champion, and Ganu's uh, rise to prominence, and now Adesanya potentially getting. Uh, Where's he from? He's from uh, uh, Nigeria. I think he's from Are Nigeria. Are all from Nigeria? I'm pretty sure, yeah. So I'll they, double check this really quick, but I, I know he is from Africa. Anyway, there is rumors. Uh, Ariel Hawani was reporting that uh, they are looking into it, uh, a card featuring all three of them at some point uh, that would take place in Africa, be the first African card. In uh, he is Nigerian-born, but he's from New Zealand. He's from New Zealand? Okay. Yeah. And Still he officially th- considers himself a New Zealander, not Nigerian. Oh, okay. So he's different than Nganu and Usman. Yeah, that's true. Okay. Um, so anyway, so we had... But you'd uh, still put him on the card. Yeah, absolutely, for sure. Um, so UFC uh, 235 was this past weekend, and there was uh, a bunch of controversy, a bunch of uh, great performances, so I'll run kind of through the... Because even the undercard was uh, really well put together as well. This is a stacked card. Uh, starting with uh, Diego Sanchez uh, mauling the crap out of Mickey Gall, kind of a very surprising... Gall like, rebound. He's super, super green. Absolutely. Um, just and he just reminder, needs, Diego Sanchez, still here, still capable. Yeah, absolutely. He just, it, it showed like he had like 10 times more experience than Gall did. Got him on the ground and like flustered him with every possible obstacle and Gall didn't know what to do. So uh, TKO uh, in the second round, I believe, in that fight. Uh, Johnny Walker continues to be a mercenary, uh, KOing uh, Sirkunov with a flying knee like a minute and a half into the first round. Like I said, the only disappointing that thing about that knee is that Sirkunov still had enough wherewithal that it wasn't a walk off. If yeah. Walker had hit, if Walker had hit him with that knee and just walked away, it yeah. would have been like one of the like five best knockouts ever. Absolutely, and uh, unfortunately, Walker will be sidelined for a little bit because he injured himself doing his signature worm celebration. <laughs> he dislocated his shoulder when he fell like flat. To yeah. do like the this weird version of the worm or something like that, but anyway, uh, so he'll be up for a couple of weeks, but nothing too serious there. Um, uh, Zabit, I'm not going to pretend, uh, attempt to say his last name because uh, I haven't remember. I haven't something it. Sharapov. Sharapov, yeah, you have the last part. I, uh, I should have rehearsed it no, before let me the see song because I think I can, this one I think I can actually do. Do you have the name there? No, I no I don't. I'll get it. We we don't, we do we do not have time. We don't have Keep time. talking, I'll find it. So Zabit versus uh, Jeremy Stevens uh, ended up going uh, going the distance. Uh, Zabit throwing a lot more kind of creative strikes uh, Stevens' way. Uh, Magama Cherapov. Okay, Magama Cherapov. I think I think you got it there. Yay, Kaylee got one. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, Zabit. Nurmagomedov. Nur- Dang it. <laughs> uh, Zabit and Stevens uh, fighting to a really uh, good decision there. Uh, it was close, 29-28. Stevens. Still can bang. Oh yeah. Well, that guy's just a, a psychopath. So he'll he's very much a Robbie Lawler type. So speaking of, we'll get to him in a second. Uh, but yeah, Zabit uh, continuing his rise up there. Uh, biggest upset of the night: Pedro Munoz uh, beat up some a, jerk I don't like. Well, Cody Garbrandt he was winning the round. Like I think Garbrandt hit him with a good shot that stunned Munho, Munoz, and then completely abandoned his game plan and went in for the kill. And Pedro made him pay pay for it. 
went to a slugfest. Did, didn't even go for the kill. Started yeah. throwing like ham fisted ham- hooks like a gorilla. Yeah. And got knocked out. Yep. God, that's satisfying. Yeah. <laughs> uh, moving on. Uh, Bad fight. loss for Tisha Torres. Uh, yeah. That was a really kind of like just uh, like lackluster kind of fight on the card. Uh, went to the decision. Um, ben Askren versus Vo- Robbie Lawler. We've got three minutes to get through the entire card, so you got to make your rant like 30 seconds. Um, I think Herb Dean could have done a better job. I think Lawler uh, responded when he grabbed his arm there. You, you don't see it from the initial angle, but you see it from the back. You see he does respond and give the thumbs up when Herb Dean uh, reaches for his arm. So um, it's really sh- crappy that Askren is parading that around like a legitimate win. Uh, Usman versus Woodley. Usman dominated. Um, yeah, Woodley looked bad. Uh, he looked like he didn't. He didn't even know what to do. And Usman, well, des- well deserving of that title. That's First, another Ultimate Fighter winner to win uh, the title. Absolutely. And Anthony Smith takes the high road to the unfortunate chagrin of the John Jones haters in this booth. Uh, got hit with a legal knee in the third or fourth round. And didn't take the DQ. And didn't take the DQ. It was a two point illegal knee too. Yeah, it was an eight eight round. Now Jones was dominating most of the fight but still another what's well, it's status quo john jones uh uh getting uh getting the win and getting away with something illegal in the process pickagrams in his uh post weight by the way really if i'm not saying i sent you the link uh, of the last of the last fight you mean not this fight was that no i sent you a link like a week ago of him getting dinged again in the this is just this past thing. weekend though this fight was just this past weekend yeah okay i mean like i think i think it was one of his pre-fight ones he got dinged again really yeah, yeah. No further discipline. Yep. Typical. Anyways, I think that's that's all we got here. So, there was no light heavyweight title fight. Kamaru Usman's the first Nigerian champion in UFC history. And the legacy belt continues to look really stupid. Yeah, that's, that about sums it up. Um, good for Usman. Yeah, absolutely. And I hope they do the like, Africa card. I don't know where you put it. I mean, people would say Nigeria. I just don't know how well the infrastructure is there for that. Mm-hmm. Though they probably would have to build something. It might be a couple years down the road now. Well, that's the thing that I'm wondering is, like, I know that they have a stadium for, like, the Nigerian national soccer team. I don't know how big that stadium is. You mm-hmm. could do an outdoor event. Ooh, that'd be good. That'd be, that'd be really good. Maybe. 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 We'll see. Uzman defends his belt in the main event. Yeah, that'd be crazy. Stylebender fights for a belt in the co-main. Well, style okay, we, we need to stop. We need to stop making up this card. But by, by, by the time that happens, Adesanya will probably have a championship belt and have defended it multiple times because it's probably still a couple years down the road. By the way, great nickname. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> oh, dude, so good. Anyway, this has been Overtime Radio here on CHSR 979 FM. Oh, actually, no. We have a minute left, and there's one other thing we actually have to do because it would be very unfair for us not to do this. What's we that? We had Haya and McMaster on, but really, really quick. Congratulations out there to cross country uh, paranordic. Uh, cross country skiers. This is Paralympic athlete Celine Cavanaugh. She won two silvers and a bronze in para cross country skiing at the Canada Games. We still are going to try to get the speed skating short track team re- team on. We mentioned that we were going to have them on for this episode. Couldn't line up the dates for that. They were a bronze medalist. Two judokas, 48 kilogram female Mahi Savoy and a 70 kilogram female Keely Hussey, both bronze medalists. And Special Olympic figure skater Molly Kane, also a bronze medalist. Those are all of your medalists from from, from New Brunswick at the Canada Games. Congratulations. Congratulations to all of you. This has been Overtime Radio on CHSR 979 FM in Fredericton. We will be back on Monday with uh, what's an episode that's going to be mostly dedicated to AUS hockey, I think. Yep, yeah. probably. And us catching up on all the stuff that we haven't gotten to cover because over the last two weeks it's been a lot of guests, a lot of stuff. You know, we had Mar on two weeks ago and then Eric Drummy on Monday. The two interviews today, so that one will be fresh, clean, regular overtime, we think. Awesome. 